Shalom, everybody. Shalom, shalom. Uh, this is Akiva Gershom, Vegan Rabbi. Thank you so much for joining me uh, and joining all of us, whether you are viewing this live or recorded afterwards. It's really an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you, even virtually, and uh, be able to share some of the things that I want to share with you tonight, today, uh, wherever you are in the world. And hold on one second. Just want to move something here. Not sure why that's there, but whatever. Okay. Um, I see something on my screen that you guys probably don't see in your screen, but it's all good. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about this topic. It's a topic that's very close to my heart. It's something that's been part of my life and on my mind for many, many years, over two decades, in fact. And um, I'd like to share some things that I've learned along the way from life, from experience, and also specifically from Judaism. Uh, to share some Jewish teachings that are, are very related to the general idea of activism and specifically with vegan activism. And we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at a few sources, uh, a few Jewish sources. Know that whenever you talk about anything and start bringing in Jewish sources, uh, the amount of sources that you can bring are, are, are almost endless. But I, I picked a few uh, just for this webinar, just to kind of get a conversation going, get a sharing going, and use them, but know that uh, as we say traditionally, what is uh, shared here is not the end all be all. It is a few selections and there's of course always a lot more. So before I start uh, my slideshow, which I'll be using to share the sources uh, and guide our, our webinar, I just wanna share a little bit about myself, a little bit about my own personal background very, very briefly, but specifically as it relates to this. Some, some of you do know me, um, even if it's virtually, um, just from my sharing from maybe a previous webinar, my online course, wherever you know me from, maybe some of you don't know me at all. I'll just share a brief little background just so you can have some context of, of who I am and, and why I'm doing this. Um, so, of course, my name is Akiva. I'm originally from America, originally from New York. I grew up in uh, a suburb of New York City, just to the northwest of New York City. I like to say I, I had a very uh, um, standard, um, I believe, uh, Jewish American suburban, not religious upbringing. Okay. Um, I didn't grow up religious in the traditional sense. Uh, I grew up going to uh, public school, which meant I went to Hebrew school. My family belonged to a conservative synagogue. Um, and like most of my friends, we went a couple times uh, a year, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and that was pretty much it. Uh, we did uh, stuff for Pesach, for Passover, but our, our, our Jewish roots weren't uh, running so deep and our Jewish practice wasn't uh, so vast. We did a couple things throughout the year, and that was pretty much it. Long story short, I get uh, to high school, towards the end of high school. Um, the little Judaism I had in my life, it wasn't interesting. It was uninspiring. It felt archaic, old, irrelevant, and meaningless to me. So I started giving up even a little bit that I had. And that continued into the very, very beginning of college, um, where I really divorced myself uh, completely from, from my Jewish identity, any Jewish practice that I or my family did have. And it was, I was really looking for something else. Um, first, second year of college, starting to get interested in, in, in spirituality and wanting to find something more interesting uh, maybe than uh, some of the parts of, of my upbringing. There's a lot of great parts of my upbringing, um, you know, thank God. But you know, when, it, when it came to meaning and, and, and purpose and, and spirituality, it was pretty much uh, absent. And so when I was in college, I started looking, searching, reading, experiencing, you know, from this ism to that ism, not thinking that Judaism had had, had any part of this search. Um, but then I started to learn about, um, well, let me pause for one second. At the end of my first year in college, um, let me even go back one step before that, actually, in, in high school, 11th, 12th grade, I started to get involved with activism. I have a twin sister. She started to get involved with activism already in ninth grade. Right? Um, she tried to inspire me, but it took me a couple more years. So by 11th grade, I was ready to, to start you know, trying to make a difference in the world. And I started to join organizations and even get into leadership positions, uh, 11th and 12th grade. And by the time I got to college, activism was really one of the main things that I wanted to do in college. Of course, in addition to courses and classes, but activism uh, outside of, of the classroom was really one of my major passions and got heavily involved right away when I got into college and um, was in multiple different uh, campus organizations and over the years eventually got into leadership positions of some of those organizations as well. 
back up a little bit um, in conjunction, almost parallel to that involvement in activism was this spiritual search. And one of the things that really brought my spiritual search to checking out Judaism again was the fact that I started to learn about uh, environmental teachings in Judaism that I didn't know anything about. I, here I am, 19 years old. Um, I thought I knew you know, everything about Judaism. Clearly, I didn't. Um, but whatever I did know seemed, as I said before, very archaic, boring, irrelevant, meaningless. But these teachings that I started to learn about the environment, about environmental consciousness and, 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 and responsibility were, were shocking to me. I never thought Judaism would contain such teachings. And that just opened up the door wider and wider for me to explore Judaism in general, but specifically these kinds of teachings in Judaism. Um, again, backing up just a little bit, by the end of my first year, uh, this kind of, you know, involvement with activism and spiritual search and thinking about the world and realizing new things about the world as I left my suburban bubble, um, I decided that I wanted to be an environmental studies major. I wanted to make a difference in the world. Um, by the end of that first year, I decided to become a vegetarian. And then about a year later or so, I decided to become vegan at the age of 19 because I realized the reason I went vegetarian is the same reason I should be going vegan. And so that was 1995. Um, vegan, environmental studies major, and just starting to, to discover Judaism in a whole new kind of way. And as I discovered these teachings, um, environmental teachings, more and more, I started to realize that, you know, there's a place for me in my own tradition. There's a place for me in my Jewish tradition. I, I, there is something that's inspiring. There is something that's relevant. It's not all just old books and people, you know, dusting them off to study some things that have nothing to do with this world, but they're old teachings. They're old ancient wisdom teachings that have a lot to do and a lot to say and a lot to share with our modern day world with how we live and how we can live better. And I'll just say this maybe as a rounding uh, off, and I'll probably say this again during the webinar, that as I learn more and more about Judaism, one of the things I started to realize, and it was really powerful for me to realize this, is that I was, as an activist, I was already doing so many Jewish things. Or, or my activism was so Jewish. Nobody ever told me that. I wish somebody had told me that. I, I did. I mean, it sounds probably shocking to everybody here, but when I was 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, and I was involved with activism, nobody told me that that's a Jewish value. I never heard of the word tikkun olam. Now, tikkun olam is like a power phrase today. Everyone knows that. Back then, nobody talked about it. Right? So I didn't have any Jewish connection or context for the activism work that I was doing. Once I started learning more about Judaism, I'm like, wow, you know, all of these years I've been so Jewish and I didn't know. You know, it's kind of funny, but it's also really inspiring. And it really made me realize that there's something in my soul that is really inspiring me to do a lot of this work. And of course, there are people in every, you know, culture and religion, ethnicity that do activism. But I will say this, and I don't mean this in any higher than thou kind of way, but it's just an interesting observation. I went to a college where there were, uh, it was a 30% Jewish population. And the activist world, which I was heavily involved with and more and more with uh, each coming year, you go to a rally, a protest, a meeting, an organization, uh, an organizing, anything, easily 70 to 80% of the people there were, were Jewish. And it was just very interesting to see that they, like me, didn't know very much about their Jewish roots, but they were doing something that made a lot of sense in the, in the bigger Jewish context. So I want to share that as an introduction, okay, to what we're talking about, because I guess because uh, of the many years I spent being very active as an activist in high school and in college and after, and then a lot of that work for me turned into the, the world of education. Um, I, I decided very clearly and very consciously in college that I wanted to be an educator. I thought that that was like a real world job that I can continue a lot of these values um, in. And I saw a lot of things and I experienced a lot of things and I still see those same things happening today as I talk to more and more activists, many young activists who are out there fighting the good fight, trying to make a difference. You know, I should say young and old, every, all the ages, right? I'm really, I'm, ever since I started this vegan rabbi work, um, just about a year ago, um, maybe a little bit more, 
um, you know, I've always been teaching about Judaism and the environment all of these years, 20 years plus, Judaism and veganism, but, but specifically with sharing it on social media, that's an idea that just came to me about over a year ago. I've been meeting tons of people and it's been so amazing and so inspiring. And I hear a lot of the same things from them that I experienced when I was younger and more of a, an active activist. And I felt as I got more into the Jewish world that Judaism has a lot to share about how we can be the best activists possible. Right, and how we can be the most balanced, and um, and 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 not not get um, taken away uh, or overwhelmed by feelings like overwhelm or hopelessness or sadness or anger, frustration. And these are very common emotions for any activist, right? And I think today maybe especially a vegan activist, but again, I think it can be shared by any. Uh, activists working in any kind of uh, realm. All right, so um, let's begin. I'm going to share uh, a few different kind of thoughts, teachings from the Jewish world that I think can be really taken into all of our work, whatever that work is, whether we're like literally out there on the streets with signs, right? Whether we're doing letter writing campaigns, whether we're on social media, whether, we're, you know, organizing uh, virtually or in person, whatever it is that we do. Right? If we care, right? if our hearts are open and we're trying to make a difference in this world, we're an activist. All right? And we are, once we open up our hearts to these issues, to these problems, we are already open to all those negative things coming in that could not only slow us down, but could really hurt us personally really hurt us on a personal, spiritual, emotional, psychological level. And that's what I really want to focus on in this webinar with the help of some Jewish, um, Jewish teaching. So I'm going to be sharing my screen right now. Okay. All right. Hopefully everyone can see that. All right. So, um, okay. Whoops, sorry. I went all the way to the, the back. Here we go. Spiritual tools for the vegan activist. Spiritual tools for the vegan activist. And it's my pleasure and honor again to be sharing this. So let's talk. Uh, I'm going to be sharing about five different ideas, teachings with everyone today. Number one, and they're not really in any specific order. Maybe they are. Maybe an order will become revealed as we go through them. I think they're all really important. All right. But I want to start with this. Number one, we're not meant to do it all. Right? I think especially when we're younger, right? especially when our, our hearts and our minds and our souls are, are really first opening up and we're seeing the problems of our world, we get so, you know, on one level overwhelmed by how many problems there are in the world, but we get so excited and passionate and motivated to do everything we possibly can to fix it all. We want to, which is such a beautiful thing. I, I, again, going back to the, the, to the story I shared with you before, I, I grew up. I lived the first 17, 18 years of my life in a bubble, in a suburban bubble, where I didn't realize the results of my actions. I didn't realize the consequences of my choices. I didn't know it. I didn't see it. Nobody talked about it. It like didn't exist. Only when I went away to college, both physically three hours away, but also mentally in a whole new kind of stage of my life and, and, and place, within myself, that I start to look at the world in a different way. And that first year of college, that's when everything started to hit me, bombard me. It was amazing. It was eye-opening. It was, um, you know, realization after realization, but it was also very, very overwhelming. I remember after that first year in college, after all these incredible realizations about the world, I mean, when we buy that product, it does that to the environment. Or when I eat that thing, it does that to animals. I mean, the simplest of things I didn't realize, Right. I was exhausted though. I was literally exhausted by the end of the year with all the things I was realizing and all the things I wanted to do, right? So I think it's very, very important, right? That we understand that we're not meant to do it all. And there's a classic, classic Jewish teaching. I mean, it's so classic. It became like a, a, a Jewish summer camp song basically, all right? But it comes from a very important text called Pirkei Avot, which is part of the set of Mishnayot of the Mishnah, <coughs> which uh, is the first part of the Talmud. Uh, first written down in the year 200 CE. It is a collection of wisdom statements from Jewish sages uh, going back 1800 to 2000 plus years ago. And one of these statements, one of the most popular, famous, well-known statements is from Rabbi Torfon. I have the Hebrew there for those who know Hebrew, right? 
Um, and but I have the English translation. It says Rabbi Tarful and said, "The day is short, and the work is plentiful, and the laborers are indolent, and the reward is great, and the master of the house is insistent." Now, there's two parts of this uh, teaching. The second one is the more famous one that got turned into a song. Let's just look at the first part for a little bit. Rabbi Torfon, right, says, the day is short. Hayom katsar. Ve'amalacha me'uba. Such a beautiful statement. I mean, that's just like, a, it should be on like a t-shirt for like activists to wear. I feel like it's like our motto, right? Hayom katsar ve'amalacha me'uba. How many times have you gone to the end of a day? Like, no, the day can't be over. I have so much more to do before the end of the week. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm like getting ready for Shabbat and it's like five minutes before Shabbat. I'm like, oh my God, I had so many more things I wanted to do this week, right? That's classic. It's typical. It's normal, all right? That's a very common feeling. The day is short and the work is plentiful. There's a ton of work for us to do in this world. And the day is short. You know, we have to eat, we have to sleep, we have to do other things. We have to go food shopping. We have to go to work or school or whatever it is. And we want to dedicate like so many hours to the, the, our passion project, you know, which in this case for many of us is, is activism in general, vegan activism in specific. And yeah, you know, we wish we'd have to sleep so much and we wish today was longer, had more hours, but it's not. The day is short. It's okay. It's okay. Don't get angry at yourself. Don't, don't you know, make yourself feel overwhelmed. Be okay. Every day you're going to do another little piece. By the end of the day, you should have a good feeling in your heart. Right? Yeah, there's always that awesome feeling of like motivating to do more. You can't wait for the next day. You know, there's times I'm, I'm, I'm at the end of Shabbat. I'm like, oh, that was such a great Shabbat. I felt so blessed for that Shabbat. And we're going to talk about Shabbat more in specific soon. But I'm also ready to jump into the week now to get back into that work mode. Right? Because we're so excited about it. it like we feel it. We're, we're doing it because we're passionate. But at the same time, we, we can't constantly be saying, oh, I keep not getting my work done. I, I, I keep, you know, uh, not finishing my, my, my list of things to do. It's okay. You know, Hayom Katsar, the day is short. You have tomorrow, God willing, and you continue your work. Give yourself a call a vote. You know, give yourself a thumbs up. Call a vote means like, good job. End the day with a good feeling, right? Even though you still have things left on your, on your, on your, on your list of things to do. I, you know, I'm trying to remember, I just told my wife something last week and she, in, in a sentence, she helped me so much. I think I said something like this. I'm like, ah, oh, I wish I had more time. That's what I said to her. I wish I had more time. And she's like, you know, my wife's a, a life coach. So this is like a perfect moment for her. She loves this kind of stuff. And she does amazing. And she helps me all the time. Um, and she said, well, did you make a list of things to do today? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, well, did you do the list of things? I'm like, you know what? I actually did. I did all of them. She's like, so call it a vote. You know, great job. You did it awesome. Right? It's not that, that like you need more time or you don't have enough time or that you're doing what you need to do piece by piece. This is a huge project. Life is a huge project, right? We're not going to get it all done in one day. We're not going to fix the world in one day. Each day, another little piece. Give yourself that good feeling for doing what you have done today, this week, right? If you're looking back at the end of the week. And that's a very important emotional thing. We can switch that in, in a moment. If we have that feeling, oh, you know, the overwhelm or stress or anxiety or oh, I don't feel good about myself, like, oh, I can't believe I didn't finish that thing. I meant to send out 10 emails. I only sent out four. Be, okay, but you, you sent out four emails. You know, we need to also encourage ourselves and be nice to ourselves and loving with ourselves to give us that motivation to keep going. We don't want to do this work from a place of, of, of anger with ourselves or, or anxiety or anxiousness or stress. We want to do this kind of work with as much love and compassion uh, for ourselves, including as possible. Let's go to the second part of this teaching, which is the more well-known one. And Rabbi Torfon goes on and he says, it is not your duty. It is not your duty to finish the work. You don't have to finish all the work. It's not up to you alone, right? There's Tons of people in this world who are also working on this. They also have the same passion that you do. And they're working on this too. You don't have to finish the work. You don't have to do everything, right? Which again, just on an emotional, psycho, spiritual level is very, very um, comforting, very positive. You know, it's not just all up to me. I don't have the, the whole weight of the shoulder. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't have the whole weight of the world on my shoulders, right? We're sharing that weight. We're, 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 dis, we're dis, uh, distributing that weight amongst all of us. I'm taking a piece of it on my shoulders, right? But I don't have to put everything on my shoulders. And, and if I do, I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually wind up 
not accomplishing what, what I'm setting out to accomplish, right? So this idea of it is not your duty to finish the work, but of course, in, in, in classic Jewish fashion, neither are you at liberty <coughs> to neglect it. Neglect it. Right? There's a hay missing in that verse over there, I see. All right. Um, <coughs> so on one side, it's not all up to us. Right? We're not meant to finish all of it. But that doesn't mean that we don't do our part. Know that we are doing our part. Let me just hold on one second. Hold on one second. Can someone just give me a thumbs up and make sure that you can still hear me? Because something seemed to change in my um, in my uh, headphones here. Good. Thank you. That was great, Mike. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was perfect. All right. I just want to make sure because it sounded different. All right. So we see Rabbi Turfone is giving us this amazing piece of wisdom, right? One level, it's not all up to us. There's other people doing it. We're doing this together. We're a community. We're a team, right? But that doesn't mean that, oh, other people are doing it. You know, don't worry. I can just chill out and do my thing and worry about myself. No, we have a responsibility. Being a human being, we have a responsibility. Being a Jew, we have a, a responsibility. If you're not of the Jewish faith, I'm sure your faith or your belief, your own personal belief will also say that. You have a responsibility in this world to make this world, to do your part in making this world a better place. All right? So there's just that balance. Again, in that, in that one line, I feel is such important um, um, advice for all of us to know, right? And we take this whole teaching together, the day by day, the piece by piece, where, where, where it's like building a wall brick by brick. We're not going to finish it all in one day. We're not the only one building the wall, right? It's not up to us even to build the whole wall, right? But we have to put our bricks in the wall. We have to know that we have to go at, you know, in, in our own way, in our own unique way, right? To take those bricks, put it into that wall that's being built to, to make this you know, uh, project, this goal be realized. Let's move on, all right? This is from a Hasidic Rebbe from a few centuries ago, all right? Rabbi Simcha Bunim. And this is a classic Jewish teaching, all right? Let's read this one together. He says this, every person should have two pockets. In one pocket should be a piece of paper saying, I am only dust and ashes. When one is feeling too proud Reach into this pocket and take out this paper, paper and read it. I am only dust and ashes. Let's finish the whole thing and then we'll talk about it, what it means specifically. In the other pocket should be a piece of paper saying, for my sake was the world created. My sake, the whole world was created for my sake. When one is feeling dis disheartened and lowly, reach into this pocket and take this paper out and read it. It's this beautiful kind of piece of you know Jewish uh, wisdom saying, in my pockets, I should have these two notes. And one says, I am only dust and ashes. I'm nothing. And the other one says, for my sake, was the whole world created? It's the complete opposites. And what's the trick? It doesn't say this here, but what's the trick? This is uh, the, 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 the Hasidic addition to this teaching, is that the trick is to know which piece of paper to pick, uh, take out at which time. Right? When do we need to hear that I am only dust and ashes? And when do I need to hear, for my sake, was the world created? Right? When we live life in general, and when we do this kind of work, we need humility. We need to do it from a place of humility, not as we say in Hebrew, ga'ava, right? Arrogance, right? We need, we need to, I mean, I, I, I feel like I can't stress this uh, enough, this idea that the, the place that we're doing our work from, that personal, emotional, spiritual place that we are doing our activist, activist work from affects everything that we do affects all of the activist work we do and the outcomes of our work, the impact, how much we're impacting, right? From what, you have two people saying the same words, doing the same action, but that emotional, psycho-spiritual uh, place that they're, that they're working from, that they're coming from, will, will really um, color their work, will really uh, affect their work in such a deep way that it will actually affect the outcome of their work, right? So we need to have this humility when we're doing this kind of work. And, and that, you know, will come out a lot when we're talking to people, when we're, when we're up against something or someone that we disagree with. How am I going to say my words? How am I going to choose my words? What's my energy going to be with that person, right? Staying humble. It's not all about me. I am dust and ashes. I am a vessel, 
right? I think in the activist language, I think that's a, maybe a better way to say it. I am an empty vessel trying to bring goodness into the world. There's goodness already, you know, that's wanting to come into this world. Let it come through me. Let, it, let me be a clear and clean, open vessel for this goodness to come into the world. So I'm only dust and ashes. I'm just a vehicle. It's not me, right? I'm just volunteering myself, so to speak, right? To be another vessel for goodness to come into the world through. On the other side, when maybe we're feeling disheartened and lowly, right, which happens to activists, we should take out that other piece of paper and say, for my sake was the world created. For my sake, the whole world, the entire creation was created for me. What's that going to do for me? It's going to like empower me. It's going to, it's going to motivate me. It's going to show me, whoa, this all was created for me. That means that I mean something, right? That means, that means I'm here for a reason. That means I have something to do in this world. That means if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. That means I got to get to, I got to get to work because what I do matters. Right? You see the difference? It's almost the same thing, but, but, but from a different angle completely. In the end, action is the result, right? As a result of both of these pieces of the paper. But the motivation is coming in a different way at a different time, depending on where the person uh, is holding, so to speak, how the person is feeling that personal space that they're, that they're found in, right? So what do I need to hear in every moment? Is it that, that, the, that message of humility that I'm just a vessel here, right? For goodness to come into the world? Or is it like, yalla, kiva, get going. Because if you don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Nothing is going to get done. It's all dependent on you, right? It's like, oh, you know, you feel like you're like this like NBA like player going onto the court, you know, like ready to like, you know, play that game. Right? And we should feel that way sometimes, right? That's, that's also a feeling we should be feeling at the right time, right? Both of these feelings are just a question of which time and what time we need to hear them. Moving on. Number two. This is such a big one, my friends. Such an important one. Recognizing the good already in the world. Oh, my, my. I'm sure you can relate already, right? As activists. I mean, what is basically the definition of an activist? Someone who wants to, to help the world, to change the world, to better the world, to improve the world, to fix the world. Why? Because there's so many problems with the world. There are so many problems with the world. And as an activist in general, a vegan activist in specific, and oftentimes we're not just one kind of activist. We're involved with all kinds of different causes. And we're, we're, we're doing, we're, we're passionate, we care. But it's like, whoa, there are so many problems in the world. This world is so messed up. I can't believe it. How are we ever going to fix it? How is it ever going to get fixed? I mean, we're just not enough people. You know, only 20 people came out to the rally yesterday. Or only 200 people came out to the rally. What, only 200 people care in this city of 10,000? What's going on? I'm on a campus of 7,000 and, and only 14 people showed up? What's the matter with people? Right, so as, as, as a direct result of us caring, right, we see lots and lots of bad in the world, lots of negativity, lots of problems, lots, lots, lots of things missing, lots of lack. Things are lacking in a world. And that could have a major, major impact and effect negatively, God forbid, but negatively on our own being. And then, of course, like I said before, I'll say it again. I, if me, my being, my person is negatively affected by what's going on in my life, then how good could I do what I want to do in this world? How much of a positive impact can I really make in this world? Therefore, I need to take care of myself as an activist. I need to spiritually, emotionally, psychologically take care of myself. And one of the ways I believe it, I see this from Judaism, right? I see this from Judaism is recognizing the good, right? Making sure I also see the good in this world okay just please give me another, another thumbs up that we're still good with the sound people can still hear me so i'm going to just do a thumbs up again for me just because okay good thank you all right so there are so many teachings that we could look at from the jewish tradition i just picked a couple right and i just want to start off with this is very very first prayer and we know in judaism the big thing is prayer three times a day all different kinds of pray prayers and blessings the first thing, according to Jewish tradition, according to Jewish tradition, the first thing that we say, I, I, I open up my eyes, I'm still in bed, I didn't put my feet on the floor yet, and the first word I say is mode, or moda for a female, mode ani lefanecha, 
I give thanks to you, living and everlasting King, for you have restored my soul with mercy. Great is your faith. There's a million things you can say about this prayer. I just want to use it for this specific reason, that I'm starting my day by giving thanks. It's a very Jewish idea. Think about it. How do you say Jew in Hebrew? Yehudi. How do you say Judaism in Hebrew? Yahadut. It comes from the word lehodot, which means to give thanks. The essence of being a Jew is to give thanks. When you give thanks, what are you doing? You're giving thanks for something good in the world. You don't give thanks for problems in the world. When things are broken or bad or hard or challenging or horrible or oppressive, you give thanks for the goodness in the world, right? And the fact that according to Jewish tradition, we are meant to start our day and our days with these words, ani, I thank. It's already starting off the day in this powerful kind of way spiritually, personally, emotionally, psycho-spiritual, psychologically, that I'm starting off with something positive. I'm recognizing right away that there is positivity in this world. And that's an important lesson for activists because we can get majorly overwhelmed, majorly overwhelmed by the amount of problems that there are in the world and that we are seeing in the world. And it only see, it seems that as activists, we see more and more problems. So recognizing the good, not ignoring the bad, Right? Not ignoring the problems, not running away from them, not hiding from them, but recognizing that there's also a lot of beauty in the world. There's a lot of goodness in the world. Take time to like literally smell the flowers. Do things for yourself. Right, Make sure you also take the time to recognize the goodness. And there's this beautiful a verse from Tehillim, from the book of Psalms, that says, Ma rabu Hashem kulam asita malaha How many? Right? Or how many numerous are the things you have made, O oh Lord, God? You have made them with, uh, made them all with wisdom. The earth is filled or full of your creations. Now, I learned from a teacher many years ago who taught me something amazing. And I try to do this literally every day. There are days that I forget. When I remember, ah, oh, I love it. And I think back to him. He taught me this like over 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, maybe. He said, there should not be a day that goes by that you don't say this verse that you don't get outside, look into the world, look into nature, look at the clouds, look at the, the, the trees, look at a bird, look at an animal, look at the moon, look at the stars, look at anything. Find the beauty in the world and say this verse. Notice the good. Be aware of what's already good. We as activists are trying to make bad things good, right? Bring more goodness into the world. Well, don't forget that there is already a lot of goodness in the world. Recognize that. Don't get pulled down by all the bad, by all the negative, by all the oppressive, by all the wrong. It's there. It's not going anywhere for now. Right? Yes, we're trying to transform it, but also take the time every single day to recognize the good. Right? Literally, have a gratitude session. I'm not even kidding. Right? Take five minutes of your day, 10 minutes if you could, and, and sit quietly somewhere, maybe close your eyes, maybe write it down or just think it in your mind, and just, just go. Brainstorm all the things you're grateful for. All the great things in your life, in life in general, in the world in general, your friends, your family, your job, your 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 sweater, your your coat, your or any whatever your food, whatever it is, right? Focus five ten minutes every single day on having gratitude for all that is good in your world and in the world, right? And that will literally. I mean, neurologically, I like to read about brain science on the side. I have a whole book called Hardwiring Happiness. And it's all about basically the more we focus on thinking positive, happy thoughts, the happier we will be. And as activists, the happier we are as activists, the more of an impact we can make. See where this is all going, right? This is for our own sake to be happier, more positive uh, human beings, but also to be more productive human beings in order to make the biggest impact in this world that we possibly can make. All right. Moving on, my friends, very, very connected. This idea of personal spiritual nourishment. We have to. It, it, it is a chova. It is an obligation. I feel very, very, very blessed in my, in, in my life. At this point in my life, year, year and a half, I started to listen to all kinds of thought leaders. I never did this before in my life, right? All kinds of thought leaders, all kinds of amazing teachers, wisdom teachers, you know, uh, podcasts and YouTube videos and people who just you know, had, have this incredible life experience and have learned so much and they're sharing it with us, the people of the world. 
we need to do things that will nourish ourselves spiritually and, and personally to strengthen ourselves. Put all those problems that we as activists focus on to the side for X number of minutes a day, X number of days a week, and focus just on ourselves. Whether that's eating right, whether that's exercising, whether that's meditating, whether that's breathing, whether that's swimming, whether that's um, prayer, whatever it might be, music, art, whatever it is, whatever it does for you whatever does it for you, make sure you're carving out the time, okay? For this one, I'm not bringing up Jewish sources. It's something I just want to talk about. Make sure right, that you are, are making the time, uh, creating the time, not only taking the time, making the time for this, right? But one of the, the things I've seen across the board from all these thought leaders that I've been listening to over the past uh, year and a half is that you have to have a morning routine. You have to have a morning routine that you don't, uh, you know, uh, um, sacrifice, you don't give up on, you know? And, and, and that's a little bit of exercise, they say, right? A little bit of some kind of breathing meditation, right? Add on some other things if you want, right? A healthy breakfast, healthy food, nourishing food, spiritually nourishing food. But this is all for you, for the physical, for the emotional, for the spiritual, for the intellectual, right? I think, hold on, yeah, I want to say that at this point as well. Reading, read, read, read up, educate yourself even more. You're probably so educated already. Educate yourself even more right? Read books that are going to lift you up, that are going to inspire you. Listen to podcasts that are going to inspire you, but do stuff for yourself so that you are the strongest like spiritual being that you can possibly be, physical and spiritual. So that again, you can have the most amazing, meaningful life possible so that you can make the most amazing, meaningful impact in this world. I feel like number, I mean, these are all important in my eyes. Number three is like, Without number three, we don't have anything. If I'm not taking care of myself physically, emotionally, spiritually, it's like what I'm doing is, I don't want to say it's uh, without a point, God forbid, right? But it's not nearly as strong as it could be if I am doing all those things. And I, and I have to say, I've, I was never a person who had like this like, you know, uh, morning routine. Uh, my life changed about, you know, 18 months ago with Corona and I shift my, my lifestyle and I feel very, very blessed as a result. And, and it created the time and the space for me to do such a thing. And it's been one of the greatest things that has happened right, in my life. And I see the difference. Right? I thank God I've always eaten healthy and, and really been into the physical food. And, but exercise is always like every now and then. Now it's every single day exercise, you know, some kind of spiritual practice. I, pr I pray three times a day, but other spiritual practices added on top of that to make myself into like the best Akiva possible, right? We're here to be the best people possible so that we can make this world the best world possible, right? But we need to take care of ourselves. If we're not taking care of ourselves, like it's, you know, you understand. <laughs> Let's go on. Taking a break, all right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking so little about activism here, but it's all about activism, right? But we need, we need every now and then to take a break from it all. Stop focusing on the bad. Stop focusing on the broken. Stop focusing on the problems and the challenges and the oppressions. Take a break from it all, all right? And, and give ourselves space. And it's very connected to something I said before, right? With number two, but to focus on the good, right? But maybe you're already imagining what in Judaism right, allows us to take that break, of course, right, Shabbat. Shabbat is this built-in take a break every single week. One out of seven days, we take a break in many different kinds uh, of ways, right, we're taking a break, but in terms of the realm of activism, one of the most amazing things I learned in my early years of, of exploring Judaism Right, for the first real time when I was 19, 20, 21, was, I'll say two things. One, that Judaism is basically an activist movement, right? I mean, what, what's a definition of, of a definition of an activist movement? An activist movement is focusing on a problem, right? An issue, a cause, and trying to solve it, trying to cure it, trying to overcome it, trying to transform it. And what's the best day ever for a certain activist movement or organization, the day that they can close up shop, pack up their office. Why? Because problem solved, right? Well, Judaism has the same outlook. Judaism has this outlook that there is a problem in this world. What's the problem? It's broken in many, many different kinds of ways. That gets expressed in all kinds of ways, all kinds of discrimination, racism, um, you know, injustice, 
and the like, and the list goes on and on and on. And our job here is to fix it. And the point and purpose of Judaism is to fix the brokenness. Well, once the brokenness gets fixed, <laughs> what happens to Judaism, right? And I know that this might sound as, as a really, um, I don't know, bizarre thought to some of you, but it's actually written in the Talmud that in the future, the mitzvot, the commandments, the actions of Judaism will become null and void. That's really powerful because when we think about Judaism, we think about action. You know, you know, yes, Jews are called people of the book, but there's actually a, there's a there's an argument that says which one is better, study or action. One opinion says action is better. That's the whole purpose of it all, right? To act in the world to make it a better place, right? And then the other argument says no, study is more important. Why? Because it leads to action, <laughs> right? So it's all, Judaism is, is, is all about the actions, all about the commandments, the 613, and then the millions of different details of Jewish law. How can we say that in the future, the mitzvot are going to be uh, nullified? It's actually written in the Talmud. I don't, I don't have it here on the, on the screen, but if anyone wants to source later, get in touch with me, I can get it for you. In my eyes, how do we understand that? Because Judaism in the future will have served this purpose, will have fulfilled this purpose. It will have created a world that's fixed. Right, and reach the goal of us being here. Therefore, the tools of Judaism, the the technique, the medium is no longer necessary because we already got to the big picture, right? So that's one thing I wanted to share. And the other thing I wanted to share is is that when I was first again getting into Judaism, one of the things that just absolutely blew my mind and impressed me to no end was this idea of Shabbat. I said once a week, once every seven days, we take a stop, we take a pause, we, we stop doing all the normal things that we, that we do. And from an activist perspective, it, for me, I understood it, you know, in those early years of exploring Judaism, and I only understand it more and more and more as the years go by, that this is a day for us to focus on the good in an intense kind of way, a full 24, 25 hour period of not worrying about all those problems out there, all those things that I'm working on, the causes, the issues, the conflicts. Right, but I am here, present in the now, to fully, fully enjoy the moment, and to celebrate this world and all of its incredible beauty that exists in it. And I love this quote from the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who just died over a year ago. And one of his writings, he writes, "The Sabbath is the uh, lived enactment of the Messianic age, a world of peace." in which striving and conflict are temporarily at an end, and all creation sings a song of being to his creator. Right? Shabbat is, you know, when I grew up, I thought Shabbat was like this long list of do's and don'ts. Can't do that. Don't touch that. What are you doing? Right? Shabbat has all those do's and don'ts in order to create a space where we have a different kind of space right, for an entire day, that we can feel something different and experience something different. And I'll say this. All right, let me just maybe share this one other quote from Rabbi uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, and then I'm going to share a few more thoughts about Shabbat. He says the, uh, the Sabbath is one of life's highest rewards, a source of strength and inspiration to endure tribulation, to live nobly. The work on the weekdays and the rest on the seventh day are correlated. The Sabbath is the inspirer, the other days the inspired. It's not like let's work six days a week and we get a day of rest. No, it's the opposite. Let's have one day a week of Shabbat so that I have the inspiration and the motivation and the know-how how to properly act in the six days of the week that come after. So not so much that Shabbat is the pinnacle of the week, right? That's more, it's like the launching pad of the week to come. And there's so many things to say about Shabbat. I just want to share a couple, right? In this, uh, in this activist context, one of the things we say in Shabbat prayers is we say that Shabbat is zecher lemaase bereshit. That Shabbat is a is a remembrance of the act of creation. That uh, when the when the entire world was created. So like, what's the connection between Shabbat and creation? Well, on one simple level, right? It's a day of rest after the whole world was created. Great, but it goes deeper than that because we know when the world was first being created, like the first moment. It says in the Jewish mysticism and in the Kabbalah that in the first moment of creation, there was just this one little piece of, of matter, so tiny that it was like as if nothing. It says it's in the Ramban, Nachmanides, right? And everything came from there. Sounds like the Jewish version of the Big Bang, right? 
So everything was contained in there. And then the, 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 the reality expanded from that, right? So if everything was contained in this one little piece of matter, everything that ever would be, would be contained in that as well. And I like to think of it as the vision of the world and the mission of the world was contained in that first tiny, tiny piece of matter from the very, very beginning. Meaning at the very, very beginning, right? Was, was already kind of encoded in reality where we needed to go, <coughs> what we needed to do, right? Um, and what we need to strive for. What was our mission? What was the vision here? So on Shabbat, once every single seven days, we're taking a pause, we're taking a step back into the space where we can say that Shabbat is in other words, that Shabbat is a reminder, a reminder of what we're doing here, a reminder of that vision, of that mission that was already in reality in the very, very first moment of anything being created. Right, so on Shabbat, we, it's like we, six days of the week, we're going, going, going. We're hoping we're doing good. But like, you know, we made a wrong turn here. We got skewed a little there. And then Shabbat comes in. It's a recalibration. It's a recalibration of ourselves in terms of that mission. Oh, oh I got a little off here. Let's recalibrate. Don't forget, right? That's where we're going. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's our vision, right? Every seven days, once every seven days for an entire day, we get to get reminded, remind ourselves, be reminded of what this world is all about and what we're trying to do and what we're here for and what we're trying to do in this world and what our role in this world is, what our place is, right? That's a deep level of Shabbat every single week. So for an activist, that's priceless. Once every week, I'm taking a pause. Yeah, I might not be doing my typical activist work, but I am spiritually aligning myself with what this is all about in the first place and why I'm doing activist work in the first place. That's one idea. Another thing we see in the Shabbat prayer, specifically in Kiddush, that we say Friday night, right? We say that Shabbat is Zecher de that Shabbat is, 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 a, is a memory or a remembrance of the exodus from Egypt. Now, that's a little hard, like Shabbos and, and Exodus. What's the connection? Well, on Shabbat, because we have this space, because we have this time, we can better remember, better think about, better contemplate that we once were slaves in Egypt. Our whole nation was once enslaved and oppressed horribly. And we got out of that. We became a nation. We came to our land. We became a religion. We became this people. In order to what? That we never forget that we were slaves in Egypt. It says dozens of times in the Torah. Don't forget you were a slave in Egypt. Don't forget you were a slave in Egypt. Why? So that you look around, you don't forget to look around the world and see, well, who's enslaved now? Who's being oppressed now? Who's being cheated? Who's being mistreated? Cheated, mistreated, right? And when we say that Shabbat is a remembrance of, of the exodus from Egypt, it's saying that this is the day too to remember. To remember that we were once oppressed, that we were once enslaved, make sure you dedicate part of your life, if not your entire life, to helping people who are oppressed, right? Get beyond that state of being oppressed. So those are two powerful things with Shabbat. It's a remembrance of, the, of, of all of creation. It's a remembrance of, of, um, of um, sorry, uh, of, of the exodus uh, from Egypt, okay? Of course, Shabbat will have that aspect of family and friends and good food and celebration, um, which is also so important, you know, that we feel a sense of community and connection um, um, <clears throat> um, in our world, right? And, um, and I was just say the last thing in terms of, of Shabbat is that, it, and, and this already kind of ties in to, to things we said before, but it gives us, if it's hard during the week to find that space to, you know, be spiritual or have those spiritual moments, Shabbat, not always, oftentimes, depending on where you are, what's going on, could be a great time to give yourself more of that time, more time to, to stretch in the morning, more time to breathe in the morning, more time to do yoga, meditation, prayer, whatever it is that you have chosen to bring more spiritual inspiration into your life, right? We have this day off built in, built in to, um, into our week, into our lives, into our tradition. And I'll just say one more last thing about Shabbat before we go on to the last thing. Sorry. And I feel like this is kind of like, you know, touching on a, on a, on a more subtle part of Shabbat. But, you know, up until now, I've been saying, you know, we take a, a rest from our activist work. 
um, on Shabbat, but on some level, we never take a rest from our activist work, even on Shabbat. How so? Now, me personally, I'm not going to go out to a rally. I'm not going to turn on a computer. I'm not going to post anything on, on social media because I don't do these things on Shabbat. So how am I affecting the world on Shabbat? I'm like being like such like this, like insular Jew, you know? Shabbat's like the most Jewish day of the week where I'm like so not connected to the world. But no, we have to realize, and this is so important, that it's not all about the physical. Judaism teaches us from the get-go, thousands of years of Jewish teachings and wisdom, right? Trying to remind us that we are not just a body. We are also a soul. The world is not only physical, it is, already, it is also spiritual. We don't only affect reality in physical ways, we affect reality in spiritual ways. And by me, strengthening myself spiritually on Shabbat during the week, if I can do it during the week, amazing, right? But at least on Shabbat, then I am actually making the world a better place. Judaism is very, very clear about this, that everything we do, whether or not it seems obvious or not, every action we take is fixing the world, is helping the world, is elevating the world, right? is bringing the world closer to its tikkun, to its fixing. Even if it's me saying a blessing over a piece of fruit, even if it's me saying this silent prayer and I'm like inside my own mind, heart, and soul, if I'm working on myself spiritually, then I am also by default working on the world physically and spiritually. It's all connected, right? It's all connected. So Shabbat is this powerful, powerful day. And of course I could do that spiritual work during the week, but at least I have this one day of the week that's carved out for me, that it's a bit easier to get that spiritual work in, but also to remember and to realize and not forget that there's a spiritual component to this work. There's a spiritual component to like, you know, helping the animals, you know, getting them free, get this horrible, you know, these horrible industries that are oppressing them, that are enslaving them, that are torturing them, that are, 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 are turning their lives into like never ending pain and suffering. There's of course a physical aspect to the work that we're doing, but there's also a spiritual aspect, right? And, and that's inside each and every single one of us. And Shabbat is just, you know, a day made for that. So I want to end just with the last kind of tool that I want to share rooted in the Jewish tradition that I believe that can help all of us become the best activists and, uh, that we can in general and, 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 and vegan activists in specific. And that is knowing what we're here to do. Knowing that we're here for a reason. I am here to do something, right? In Judaism, in Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism, it says that every single person is born for a reason. Right? If you're born, that means you have something to do in this world, something very unique to do, something that's connected to the generation, right, to the world, but also connected to your own spiritual self. Right? And your being alive right now, by definition, means you're here to do something. Right? So yes, we're going to get overwhelmed sometimes. Yes, we're going to like scream and shout and work and do and act and all these things, and it feels like nothing's happening. Nobody's listening. Nothing's changing. It's just getting worse. What do I do? All right? That feeling of overwhelm. That feeling of overwhelm. Right? So what gives us the motivation to keep going? Right? How do we keep going if it seems like we're going backwards sometimes? Right? And of course, there are times when we feel, many times that we feel we're going forwards. But what do we do with those other moments? This beautiful short quote from the, from the book of Amos in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible. Right? He says, Adonai Elohim diber, mi lo yenave. My Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesize? Right? Well, what, what does he mean and how does this relate to, to us? I mean, as, as a Navi, as a prophet, he's saying like, you know, let's just give a little context because I think it's a very, very important parallel. In the days of the, of the Nevi'im, of the prophets of Israel, goes back thousands of years. It was not easy being a prophet. Look through the, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. It's filled with stories of the prophets not being listened to. They're trying to get the people to change, become better physically, spiritually, all these things. A, a, avert destruction that's being warned about. And it's like the people never listen. So being a, a prophet in ancient Israel was one of the worst jobs possible. It was one of the hardest tasks, right? And we know all kinds of prophets, even Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, complains to God about having to deal with these people who just don't listen. And Amos says something so powerful. So then, like, why do you keep prophesizing? It's like asking a leader. Like, why are you a leader? It's so hard to be a leader. The people, 
They don't want to listen, right? They fight against you. They make your, your life so challenging, right? All these different reasons why it's so hard to be a leader, right? Are also all the reasons why it's so hard to be an activist, right? Because it feels sometimes that like maybe we're not making a difference. Maybe it's going too slow. Maybe it's not fast enough. What's going on? Are we going to succeed? I don't know. How can I be hopeful when it just, everything feels like it's breaking apart and falling apart? Let me look at Amos. He says, I'm a prophet. That's who I am. My God has spoken and my job is to prophesize, right? And I feel like in our modern day context, we can say that about ourselves. We're not modern day prophets, but we are trying to be leaders in this society and in these societies that make a difference. And we might feel like the people aren't listening. So why should I continue with my work? Because that's who I am. And that's why I'm here. That's why I was brought into the world. By de definition, that's who Akiva is and all of you. So I, I can't stop because it, if I stopped, I would stop being myself. Right? That's who I feel I am. Keep going. Right? Actually, I'm going to skip this one out just for time's sake. Okay? We're going to go back to this uh, teaching that we looked at before, but with a twist in it. Right? This is from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Right? And he says, he quotes that teaching. He says, each person needs to say, the entire world was created for me, like we learned before. It comes from the Talmud. And then he goes on, he says, one finds, since the world is created for my sake, I need to see and look in every moment into repairing the world. He uses the word tikkun olam there. And to replenish what the world lacks and to pray on their behalf. You see a physical component? First of all, what am I here for? I'm here for tikkun olam. Why am I in the world? That's the only reason, Right? Now, within that, there's all different pieces and parts. I'm also here to fix myself, to perfect and elevate myself. But that's all part of the bigger picture of Tikkun Olam. Right? So Rabbi Nachman, one of the most important Hasidic Rebbe's, is saying that we need to look, if the world is created for me, and he's saying it is for each one of us simultaneously, then we need to look at the world, then we need to look at every moment to the world of the world and look at what we can do to fix the world, to replenish what the world lacks, physical component, and to pray on their behalf, spiritual component. We are here to fix the world spiritually and physically. And I'm not going to stop no matter what happens because that's why I'm here. That's the purpose of my life, right? That's what I was brought into this world to do. It is my identity. It is my personality. It is my being, right? And yes, it's going to get hard. Anytime we try to do anything amazing or good or different, anytime we try to rock the boat, anytime we try to do something that's going to change something, of course, it's going to be hard. Don't give up from the get-go, from the beginning. Already commit. Quitting is not an option. I'm not quitting no matter what. Yes, I might have hard days. That's fine. That's all part of it. Yes, I feel like I'm going to completely fail. I organized this, uh, you know, uh, webinar or this movement or this protest or this rally or this something, and barely anybody came. You might be like, oh, forget it. I'm not doing this anymore. No. That's just one part of the process. Yala, move on, as we say here. Yala, move on. Fail, learn from that. Look at it. Why do you fail? What happened? What were the, what were the circumstances? Da, da, da. What can you learn from it? How can you pivot? Whatever. Right? We're like startups here. We're like entrepreneur, uh, entre, uh, entrepreneurs, like each, single, each and every single one of us, right? Social entrepreneurs trying to make this world a, a better place. We cannot give up. Right? You talk to anybody who has created a successful startup, they're going to say the same thing. I failed 1,317 times, right? But I didn't give up. I told myself I was never going to give up. We can't give up. That's what Judaism is all about, not giving up. Guys, let's look at the history of the Jewish people, right? It's like one big, we're not giving up. If we said once that we're giving up, we wouldn't be here today, right? And the same thing comes with our activist work. <sighs> So the last quote that I want to share is from uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, right, who died in 1994. And uh, this actually comes from the story. Somebody came to the Rebbe. He met with people all the time. I mean, tens and tens of thousands of people over his lifetime. And one person he said, uh, came to him in a meeting and said, I'm so overwhelmed by the brokenness of our world. I'm, I'm saddened. I'm overwhelmed. I'm broken. There's so much darkness in the world. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to deal with the darkness. What do I do, Rebbe? This person said to the Rebbe. And the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe said back to this person, he said, your job is not to fight the darkness. Your job is not to dispel the darkness. Your job is to increase the light. Right? We know there's a lot of darkness in the world. We know there's a lot of light in this world. Hopefully, at least from this webinar, we know that. We have to see the beauty, the light that's already in this world. But our job is to increase the light. Not so much to fight the darkness head on, right? But to increase the light. Keep focusing on the positive, 
right? Now, of course, it's going to mean like, you know, uh, standing up to and confronting some like, you know, people, organizations, industries, companies, you know, that are doing really horrible things in this world. Of course, it doesn't mean that we don't confront that, that we don't try to stop them. But just this spiritual kind of mindset. That I'm not trying to get rid of the darkness. I'm trying to increase the light, which as a result, of course, right, makes the darkness go, dissipates the darkness, right? We need to focus on the positive. And maybe that's the last thing I want to share in this webinar is that as activists, the thing that I got the most, I mean, there's so many things <laughs> uh, I got from the, from the Jewish tradition in terms of how to be the best you know, person I could be, the best activist I can be. Um, but going back to something I said before, it's like how I'm doing my work. It's not just what I'm doing, it's how I'm doing it. Right? And of course, we slip and we fall and we mess up and we get angry and we scream and we, you know, because we care. We care. We want this world to be a better place already now. Why do we have to keep working at it? Why do we have to wait even longer? Like, didn't we do enough already? <sighs> right? But clearly not. Right? And, and the work is still there. We still need to do it. But again, the, it's not only what we do, it's how we do it. So to the, to the, the, to the extent that we can Right? However much we can, do our work, do our active, activist work with love and compassion. I don't hate that person. I don't hate that person. I hate what they're doing. I hate their action. I hate the consequence. I hate the pain and suffering that's causing to those animals. Right? If we can make that shift, if we can bring more love and compassion into our activist work, I truly believe we can make a bigger difference in this world. I'm just remembering back to college that by the time I got to my senior year in college, after being part of many different movements and organizations and working with many different activists, I decided to, to create something new. And it was a different approach to activism. And it was one that was based more on a lot of the things that we just talked about here. Um, <coughs> love and compassion and celebration and, and positivity. Going to those rallies, going to those marches, but with a whole different mindset. Right? And a whole different approach. And I remember, I'll just share this, maybe with this I'll end. I remember this one protest that, I, um, that uh, we were joining, you know, my organization and the people that were with me. And uh, we had to walk down this hill from our college campus to where the, the, where the rally was. And we're marching and, you know, going down there, a whole group of us in a certain kind of way. And then there was this other organization, I don't want to say names, but they had a whole different approach. They had like these, like, you know, signs and megaphones. And I'm not against signs and I'm not against megaphones, right? But they were just screaming or already on the walk down. They weren't even there yet. They were screaming. They were so angry. And, and their energy was so different. In my eyes, right? Sorry, I sound a little judgmental. It was so off, right? It, 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 was, it was creating more of that negative energy in the world. And, and we can't fight negativity with negativity. We can't fight darkness with darkness. We have to fight it with light. We have to fight negativity with positivity. And I feel that that is, that is one of the essential Jewish teachings of life in general, but specifically for us, those people that care, that care so much, that want to make this world a better place. Right? And it's hard sometimes. And of course, we're going to slip. And of course, we're going to fall. And we're going to get angry. We're going to do all these different things. But to the extent that we can remember that, I really believe It'll impact our lives in incredible positive ways and impact our work in incredible positive ways. And as a result, by default, I impact the world in incredible and positive ways. So I want to thank everybody for joining uh, this webinar. It was a pleasure and an honor uh, for me to share. Um, and hold on one second. It was a pleasure and an honor for me to share. And um, I just want to give a blessing to all of us. Um, call a kavod that you care. Call a kavod that you're here. Call a kavod that you're watching this. And even if you're not watching this, call a kavod for the work that you're doing in this world, uh, for the animals, for the environment, for the people, for the world, for everything, right? Really realizing that what we're here in this world to do is to make this world a better place for every single level of creation. And that's definitely the Jewish vision. That's definitely the Jewish mission. And I hope we can all be inspired um, by these teachings and all the other teachings that are out there um, to be the best people we can be, be the best activists we can be, so that we can make this world the best world it can possibly be. So shalom and tada to everybody and all the best. <laughs>